agriculture, agricultural sector in Brazil and Latin America. And on the last 10 years, I've been working with finance, green finance mostly, um, on the private equity, on the equity, and on the credit side. I hope that our session should be very resourceful for you all, and uh, please do not uh, give up on us. So that's what I ask of you, that on the end of the discussion, you may feel uh, nurtured by those experiences, but most of all, provoked by our mistakes to not commit them again. So, uh, let's start. Great, so I love the introductions. Uh, but moving on, on a more serious note, uh, as you all know, Latin America is a region that experiences a lot of economic and political instability and also disproportionate impacts of global geopolitical events such as the COVID-19 pandemic and the Russian Ukraine war. So my question is, uh, what are the main reasons to the risks associated with investments in Latin America and um, what are the main challenges for the region to overcome? Um, I think that that question, I mean, if I may take a, a hit on it, has, has certainly changed and evolved through time. Let me give you a little bit of context. Uh, Ten years back, 15 years back, I think that most investors, whenever they thought about Latin America, they thought about uh, Lula, they thought about Dilma, they thought about, you know, uh, Umala in Ecuador, the, I mean, they thought about, uh, I mean, in Peru, they thought about all these guys rattling the system, challenging the institutions, and they weren't so certain that financial markets would actually withstand those, that roller coaster that Jose just, just pointed, pointed to. Plus, on top of it, you had very local companies, the majority of the Latin American market, except for Mexico, or Mexico, but the majority of the Latin American market is one that is very focused on the domestic sectors. I mean, even, even Mexico, beyond the financial market, most of the economies in Latin America depend on over 70% of their domestic economy. So when you take into account that this whole legal and institutional framework is being challenged by all these ups and downs in politics in the region, you don't want to, you're not sure that 5% of the MSCI, which is MCI world, which is what Latin America is worth, or what, I mean, it was worth a little bit more than that, but let's say, take it between 7 and 5%, was actually worth your mind share. If you think of it, with oil booming, uh, EMEA, which is worth more or less the same in the MCI world, is probably a better region to invest in, where you have a little bit more visibility, at least on the drivers that are pushing the prices forward. Or think of Asia, right? With the demographic bonus that you have there. So that was the problem in Latin America. In Latin America, it's not so much that it was riddled by uh, idiosyncrasies, but rather that it was taken as a whole that wasn't really meriting the time of investors to actually put some mind share to it. One thing has changed though, and this is very important to keep in mind going forward, especially for you guys who are starting or, or thinking about starting your careers. Idiosyncrasies, political idiosyncrasies in Latin America are never going to take a step back, but the market is no longer weighing those that much, and that is something that many people tend to forget or tend to overlook. Why? Because whether we want it or not, we are living in a much more globalized world, and we'll talk more about that in terms of the challenges or what to look forward into the future, but we're right now into a more globalized world in which markets in particular move much more in tandem with what, with what is happening globally than what is happening domestically. A clear example of it is, forget about rates in Brazil and whether the Popom actually cuts more or, let, or, or hikes more or less. But what happens with the Fed and then the real goes through the roof, okay? So this is, exactly what I, this is exactly what I mean. Markets are much more tied to what's happening globally than local idiosyncrasies. And right now, there's a lot of focus on individual companies and individual assets uh, in terms of how companies have managed to navigate these global mindset and global uh, context rather than focusing on their domestic economy. So I think that that is, that is something that we need to keep in mind when thinking about Latin America as part of our portfolio going forward in terms of the relationships that each of the countries have and how they interact with the, the rest of the world, with the developed world and of course the rest of the emerging markets. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, I think that what you mentioned about um, the, about the Latin American countries interacting with the developed world is something that 
Yeah, we, we should um, focus on, and I think it kind of opens up to our next question, uh, which is about uh, how in many Latin American countries the uh, the primary sector, so mainly agriculture, uh, is a very important part of the economy. And uh, my question is, uh, how can we make sure that we are considering the advantages that we have, um, ge geographical advantages to have to have agriculture in uh, Latin American countries at the same time that we are fostering uh, sort of fostering economic development once uh, many. Uh, developed countries usually take a more industrialized uh, road, but that's not what happened in Latin America. But we can still take advantage of that. So my question is, how to better navigate that? Um, well, I think we can start talking, uh, reflecting on all of the answers that you have uh, brought to us. It's about the size and the total share that Latin America has on the total financial assets global. We're talking about five to seven percent. Uh, but there is a huge asymmetry when we look at the share of our natural resources. Uh, when we look, so let, let's take a look at this one, because Latin America is huge and extremely complex. There are very different landscapes, very different policies. But uh, looking at Brazil, 28% uh, of all the forests in the world are located in Brazil. Over 40% of the biodiversity is based in Brazil. Uh, at the same time, over 50% of the deforestation happens in Brazil. So when we talk about the uh, new green economy, we are talking about those important indicators. Uh, we can't keep struggling to be the leaders of the economy of the 90s. Sometimes I feel like that. We are struggling to be the economic champions of the 90s decades, uh, of the next decades. So uh, looking at that and looking at specifically on our uh, agricultural sector, uh, when we look at Brazil specifically, uh, we see that Brazil is the fourth largest GHG emitters in the world, historically speaking. Right now, we are the fifth, but historically, we have been the fourth. And very differently from uh, USA, Canada, or Europe, or China, the largest uh, source of uh, GHG emissions left in America, and Brazil specifically, is land use. We are talking about agriculture, livestock, and land use, deforestation, fires, and so on. We are talking about 8% of our emissions. It's not something trivial. 8% is, is uh, energy based. 80% is land use or land, use, land based economies, such as agriculture. And we have trusted historically on our geographic advantages. We have been wonderful for coffee. Why? Uh, attractiveness, we were vocationated for that. Sugarcane, the same. Livestock, the same. Soy, the same. Uh, but one thing that is going uh, very differently, very disruptively compared to the other cycles is that geographic advantages are not advantages anymore. Well, when we talk specifically about the agricultural sector, now let's look to our uh, exporting uh, balance in Brazil. What we what what does what do we mean in Brazil export? Basically, on agricultural sector, we are talking about soy, corn, and beef. And soy and corn for beef. And so, eight percent of everything that's produced for soy and corn goes to and beef to produce more beef. Uh, when we look globally, we have seen there was a decrease on the demand of any protein in general, and this. Uh, in my opinion, we have we're living on a deep point that the consume of animal protein will go down and down and down. And when we look at that specifically uh, phenomena, and for example, we look at uh, plant based and uh, lab grown cultivated meat, all the technology that has been developed. And when we look at when I go into a fast enough farm right now, I have to think two, three decades ahead of that's the time in which I'm going to have to break even. Do we really think that uh, to produce livestock, soy, and corn will be profitable in three decades from now? That's the point. Well, considering all of that, what can we start thinking about, uh, about our culture production in Brazil on the European economy? On short, uh, on short notice, what we are facing is the change of regulatory aspects in general. 
Europe has just approved a new regulation uh, based on forestation free commodities. And the comprehension of what is forest for Europe is not, uh, it covers everything but Donbass and uh, Gabunka. Everyone else is forest. So it has been forested legally or illegally. There is no difference. Mother Nature doesn't know how to read the forest code. And we do not allow it to be exported to Europe. Not only the raw materials, but the any products that has used the raw materials. The the Ferrari, if you have a the ladder on the on the seat, if it has been produced on a deforested area after 2019, is considered to be a forestation based product. And Ferrari will face a major uh, fine by the European Union. And this regulation in Europe is not only in Europe. Here in the United States, we have the U.S. Forest Act. The United Kingdom, we have the U.K. Forest Act. China is already doing the same in 2025. So we have a shortage of addressable markets. If you don't start uh, tackling the forestation, we are going to have uh, even less addressable markets on our region. And finally, when we look at the addressable capital sources, uh, we have that most of the financial sources, and we're talking here, uh, about 47% uh, of all the financial, uh, all the funds globally, they are already connected to some sort to a net zero or forestation zero commitments. If you don't have transparency on the impacts that we are going to generate, you are not being festival anymore. In Brazil specifically, we don't have traceability. If you don't have traceability of our products, how to declare that we are forestation free? and that we are all risk for investments. So when we look at the, our cultural sector, and I can keep talking for one hour more, but I can't, I know that but well. Uh, we have to understand that we have to not to abandon our agricultural sector, it's wonderful, but we have to reinvent it. To be forestation zero, to be carbon active, not carbon positive as we are nowadays, and more diverse, not only trusting on animal proteins, corn, and uh, and so I, we have to think about agroforestry, we have to think about uh, forest products. Carbon credit is not a commodity, a very strong commodity, if we can talk about it. I can talk about the next question. But uh, we have to rethink our agriculture according to the new rules. ESG is not just a uh, passion, not just a trend. ESG is the new rules of the game. So we have to learn how to play this game with those new rules. Okay. Uh, thank you. So, Jose mentioned uh, that the ESG factor is becoming increasingly important uh, when selling commodities, in the case of Brazil, especially concerning the European regulations and of uh, more countries that are adopting that policy. Uh, so, my next question would be, uh, what other factors uh, do we consider when evaluating an investment opportunity in uh, Latin America? I think the first one that you need to take into Beyond ESG, of course, and, and it has to do a lot of with the profile of what is the, what, who's the investor who's looking at Latin America, right? Is it a risk averse? Is it the, is, are they more risk prone? Uh, what is their time horizon? There's a lot of things that you need to take into account, and we all learn these in business schools that you need to take into account when you are setting up a portfolio, when you're setting up an investment. For Latin America in particular, politics are always going to be an issue. Um, we, as a region, are moving much more to the left, but it's a different left. I think that as a region and as a world, to be honest, we are moving to the, to the, not the status quo. I don't mind if that's the left, I don't mind if that's the right, it's the same thing, but as long as it's different, as long as it's not the status quo, that's what we're moving towards. And the same goes for, uh, for our region. So we'll just have to learn to navigate this environment. As I was highlighting before, I think that markets in general, and once again, it's very much dependent on your time horizon, but if you're thinking more short term, then locally these increases matter much less. If you're thinking long term though, one has to evaluate very clearly these sort of regulatory hurdles, investment policy, uh, respect or regards for institutional framework that we have across our region and how much of that is going to be able to be sustainable in order to allow companies that are currently operating in our region 
to profit not only from their local market, but also to continue to diversify abroad. And there's one very important trend that I would highlight here in Latin America that of course is happening globally, but maybe it is because of my bias, maybe it is because of where I, of where I come from, the markets that I cover. But one, see, one thing that I see and that really calls my attention is that we are a hub. Latin America is a hub for development. And let alone, you know, the uh, Lojas Americanas, or the Petrobras, or the Vale, or the Womex, or the Palavela. Forget about those listed companies. It's not about those anymore. It's about Nubax. It's about XP. It's about all these companies that are being disrupted, that are changing the way that things are being done. And of course, this not only happens in Latin America, but it happens around the world. But particularly Brazil, I mean, we have, that in, we have them in Argentina, we have them in Mexico. I'm not saying that the rest of the countries are you know, just falling quiet and, 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 and going to bed on that. But it's, we're really rethinking the way that we do things. And I think that you guys, as a new generation, are really, I don't know what's the right word in English here, so I'm going to say it in Spanish, and I hope that you guys understand. Semillero. Do you know what that means? Yeah. Yeah. So I think that you are like the semillero for new ideas, for disruptive ideas. And that's, I think, the market that we're going to have to learn how to, I'm going to have, when I, you know, 20 years from now, you guys are going to be our bosses. I'm going to be working for one of you guys for sure. Well, I hope so, but I know if I'm going to be making that money living in New York. Uh, so I think for sure. That's another story. Uh, so it's very likely that I'm going to be working for one of these guys with all these new ideas, and we're going to have to adapt to a new market uh, to a new environment. So I think that that's one thing that investors are really focusing on when thinking about investing long-term in Latin America. And when I received the guide, the question guide for preparing for this panel, one of the things that really caught my attention is that when we tend to think about financial markets, we tend to think about the listed markets. But uh, Jose here pointed out something that they are doing in JGP, which is private markets. I am not here to buy you one against the other. I work in public markets and I love them. But I, I think, honestly, that we are becoming stale on the public side. Brazil, not so much, because there's clearly a lot more push to develop that. The new avenue for growth is private markets. And that's where we're seeing a lot of investments. I mean, if you take the global context, of course, Latin America is just a tiny piece of it. But more than 80 billion, 80 billion, okay, with a B, came into Latin America in the last couple of years as flows from private equity in venture capital. And that's like, what, like 40% or 30% of the venture capital flows around the world. So we're speaking about Latin America attracting more than 40% of the venture capital and private equity funds flow from the world in just two years. And that's the years of the pandemic. So that pretty much tells you what is happening in Latin America, how much more, how much, I, how many ideas are actually growing in the region. So I think that that is something, the human capital that we have, I mean, there's a ton of challenges, there's all these politics, there's all these left-wing governments always rambling against whatever, everything, but there's so many opportunities in the ESG space, in the payment space, in the financial space. I mean, Latin America has a financial inclusion of less than 60 in developed markets, it's 19%. I mean, there's so much room to grow in different regions that that is something that I, that's the opportunity that I think that investors are looking at when thinking about Latin America. Latin America. But once again, it's very different. If you, if you want to come out of here with ideas and then go directly into your trade platform and say, what do I need to buy? Then that's a very different answer than what I'm giving to you right now. What I'm giving to you right now is you guys as the future leaders of hopefully the investment community in the world, what you need to focus on. And what you need to focus on is to make sure that that semillero, the next, the next crop of semillero, are able to fit into and make able to grow the, those opportunities for our region. And go back to our region. Let's all go back to our regions and make sure that what we learn here actually fosters development in our country. Yeah, that's what I'm uh, and let, uh, let us not forget that we are part of Latin America. Sometimes we forget that about the result, that we are not part of Latin America. Uh, almost lastly, 
Bank in Colombia to discuss Panamasonian finances and the new stock exchange and the stock exchange. I was the only representative of the financial sector on this meeting. So we are talking about how to create nature-based solutions for Amazonia. We have the largest share of the Amazon forest, and we were not there. Why? Because the presidents are Latin. Petro and Bowie. So, uh, we have to... I don't think we have to any more English one. Uh, there's a graph syndrome. We would love to go sideways. Left, right, left, right, left, right. Have to go forward. And uh, sometimes we are so uh, overcome by all this political discussion that we are closing very important doors for our expansion. Uh, we talk about nature-based solutions. Nature doesn't respect borders. So Amazon, six countries in our region are uh, have the Amazon forests inside. And why we are not talking about Mexico has a lot of different social and environmental challenges that we have in Brazil. Why are we not working together to overcome those problems and create the Latin American companies uh, that will be accelerated by the outcome of our social and environmental problems? We are not discussing with the other Latin American countries. We discuss much more with Europe, the United States, than we do with Colombia and Mexico. It makes no sense. So, you, on, on your future, remember that south to south cooperation is much more important than north to south banking. Or east to west. You touched on a very important point. Uh, there is very little interconnectivity in Latin America when you compare that across to what you have in Europe to what you have in Asia. And Camila was telling me before we met here, so what are some of the benchmarks? And I don't want to get ahead of ourselves. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, you know, what, what are the benchmarks that we can follow? And my answer to her was there are no benchmarks. Latin America is special on its own. And one of the things that really appalls me when looking at the region is that how many flights do you guys think that leave out of Mexico for Brazil every day? One. Huh? One. Okay. How many flights? I mean, I'm not even going to say the U.S., right? Because we're next to each other. We have so many links. Okay, so forget about the U.S. How many flights do you think that leave from Mexico to leave a country in Europe? U.K. U.K. Six. France. Six. China. Two. We have two daily flights from Mexico City to China every day. We have one to Brazil. Why is that? Why can't, why can't our region become more interconnected? In Mexico, we're always thinking about how to get more, more, more into the U.S., right? And then we're talking about nearshoring, and we're talking about industrialization. And in Brazil, you're always talking about China. And in Chile, they're always talking about copper and how that plays out for the China story. Why are we looking so far away from ourselves? If we're thinking about industrialization in Mexico, they, why, why can't we take advantage of the iron ore that is produced by Tabe? Mm -hmm. Why can't we take advantage of the copper that is produced by Southern Copper in, in Chile? So those are the things that we really need to start thinking about in terms of how to grow our region and how to position it better so that investors actually come back and take a look at us. Mm -hmm. And we go back to 20 years ago when Latin America was 20% of the NCI world. Uh, I think that was a great perspective about uh, interconnectedness in, in Latin America. Uh, since we have so many shared characteristics and um, and we share the same territory, as you said, Amazon forest, it is very important for um, for countries to talk to each other and uh, cooperate in order in order to uh, find solutions. So, um, going off of that, I wanted to touch uh, base on how is ESG currently in uh, Latin America, and specifically also what, um, what specific uh, framework do you use to evaluate um, ESG factors when considering an investment? Uh, we were discussing just before this mm -hmm. conversation. Are you going to keep it a secret self? Uh, no. <laughs> it's mine. Uh, but uh, ESG, most of the funds, globally speaking, the ESG uh, funds, they are based on ESG data providers. We have MSCI, Sustainalytics, plant of those data providers that will provide you 
Well, the data, they are based mostly on anything but science. Uh, we don't have a full coverage of the Latin American companies. We have, as a matter of fact, most of those ESG data providers, they don't cover Latin American assets. Our largest Brazilian companies, they are not uh, monitored by those companies, by those data providers. And when we look at those ESG data providers, as we are a very small share of the global economy, uh, they use it through consultations on the websites of the companies and on press info, on media clipping, what a lot of controversies that were published on international media. Some of them, don't, some of those uh, ESG providers, they do not have Spanish speaking or Portuguese speaking teams to make an analysis on Latin America and Brazilian companies. So when we look at that, it's almost impossible for us to have the proper uh, ESG data, uh, ESG funds based on Latin America or BRICS or any kind of approach, geographical approach, because of the lack of the shortage of data available uh, by uh, provided by those ESG data providers. And uh, lately, when we talk about the ESG uh, funds inefficiency on providing better uh, results for the investors, when we keep, when we keep the uh, for us it was, okay, let's see what has happened. More than half of those funds were based on like technology companies. And why? Because the ESG data providers, they consider the technology companies as having the low carbon industry. They consider the indicators as indicators that they are much better than any other industry. So a lot of, a lot of different uh, asset managers, investment banks, and uh, everyone else just increase the volume of their portfolio based on technology business sector. So, when you have a, a negative uh, performance of the technology sector, the ESG sector was crazy because more than a half is based on technology. Almost none is based on commodity. So we have a, a hike on the commodity side, but a decrease on the technology side. And when we look at our ESG of Latin America, we can be quite well driven by the commodity-based sector, commodity-based industry. But we don't have framework for that. Uh, I was, uh, we are signatories of a commitment with other 32 uh, corporate asset managers globally, uh, $8.7 trillion in global AUM, and in which we're not going to finance uh, commodity treatment for station after 2025. Everybody signed it during the COP26, Glasgow, now we have to deliver. The challenge for the delivery is that there was no, that there is no available deforestation framework by the ESG data providers. Because when we look at deforestation, it's a real problem for us in North America, but not necessarily for other states or Europe. Either the problem is the energy sector, the energy transition, not major data solutions. So uh, what we're doing now in JGP uh, over the last two years was to create proprietary frameworks that can be used to analyze not only Brazilian assets, but Latin assets. Uh, with proprietary indicators that are connected to international taxonomies, such as stakeholders, capitals, metrics, GRI, uh, SPTI, we are not creating something new. We are just considering every taxonomy available and translate them to our reality result. Nowadays, we have over 140 listed companies analyzed by our uh, ESG center. And uh, we talk about uh, private companies. Uh, we are coming to not on public equity, but on private equity. Uh, mostly on the credit side, private debt strategies. We have over 200 different structures analyzed by our uh, frameworks. It's, uh, it's not cheap, it's expensive, but at least we can uh, we can provide the real results for our investors. We can tell the investors what's the kind of impact that we are creating through the capital allocation on those assets. Uh, that's the kind of uh, impact, and that's the kind of information that's not available globally. Uh, what we are going to start from next year on is to share our frameworks in front of the public. So uh, what others should do the same. We are already discussing the creation of a uh, human-based index that is based on leadership and corporate culture, how to evaluate companies through those aspects, through those lenses, 
and for Reddit apps, uh, based on conversation risks and near two risks. So we want to make it public for the others to share their own companies, their own results, to create a crowdsourced platform for everyone in Latin America, and to be better connected with our asset managers in Europe and the United States. And just to uh, make a closing of the statement of the question, um, when you talk, for example, to a generation in small development, uh, Fidelity, Venga, and of those global that are always ESG oriented, uh, what we are starting to need, and it's very important, is not just the information sharing, but also uh, sharing the ethic ownership and engagement. Because when you produce an iron at Pali, or a uh, leather by JPS, someone has to buy it. Adidas, Tesquery, Tesco, Ford, any other company abroad has to buy it. So we have to make it, uh, the ethic ownership, the engagement must be done through the supply chain aspects. Not only who produces, but who buys it, who purchases that. When you do that, you create a new relevance for the Latin America, uh, Latin America region. Because we are the Latin America, we are the boots on the ground for those international investors. When you keep transparency on the risks that an Adidas, that uh, any company that is located in Europe and the uh, United States that has perfect <coughs> sports on ESG, through Sustainalytics and NSCI and others. But when they, because they do not consider their supply chain, we have supply chain. So when we provide transparency on the supply chain flaws of those companies, they will have to make something about that. And now and then we create a whole new economic cycle. When an Islip, uh, when a leader, uh, provides a pledge of rich narrative and culture, we are going to be rich narrative, no trade daddy. They do not produce cacao in Switzerland. They produce cacao in Mexico, in Brazil, they do not. Uh, so they have to manage the transformation of their supply chains. And that's one of our best opportunities for Latin America. For the world to be rich in Arabia, for the world to be net zero, for the world to be human inclusive, they have to fix Latin America. And that's where we can be extremely material and reliable for those people. And the only way to do that is to provide good information, proper frameworks that relates our characteristics or similarities. And, and I think that you're making a, a, a key point, Jose, uh, that is regulation. We're lacking regulation in Latin America. Okay. And I think that our governments still have a long way to go, not only to uh, audit companies, but also to enforce that. Okay. And, to, and to make that a priority for consumers as well. Mm -hmm. What type of meat are you buying? What type of cream are you buying? Mm -hmm. uh, what type of leather shoe are you buying? Yes. Uh, but uh, I think that uh, the, most of the problem of pre pre-stability and political barriers to apply pre-stability, there's a lot of political antagonisms that do, do not accept pre-stability mostly of the livestock sector. Uh, some because of conspiracy theories, others because of criminal activities that are connected to human laundering on the livestock and other aspects that we don't need to go. Yes, totally. And uh, that is really struggling with regulations. But I think that uh, the lack of regulation is something that is very intended in our region. And uh, we, as part of the private sector, of the financial sector, we are everywhere. Nobody does, no company does, does anything without the financial sector engagement. So, on the absence of regulations, we have to be enforcing our perspective. What's the correct uh, what's the correct trajectory for those companies? We have to be more proactive and we have to be scared. Because uh, uh, if I am at JGP, we are free to not be fast on for station. But we have 38 billion pounds. Look at the, uh, the size of the of the market Brazil. They will look at someone else. Okay, they will not this company will not have the reputation came to have a JGP as investors, but it's okay, at least they have the money. So we have to be together as an financial sector, giving a way out for those companies and for those projects. That's so important for us to be integrated, because no one invests in Latin America as Latin Americans. We have to be more closer and working together. And that uh, invest more on the region, the last aspect.
every country, all the elites of our countries, Mexico, Brazil, we invest more abroad in our own region. Uh, there is a cloud, uh, early cloud index produced by San Carlos University in, the, in Switzerland. Brazil, among 150 countries, we are on 97 on the right. We are one of the world's worst elites in the world, and we just lost for Venezuela in Latin America. And uh, it's very close. Maybe next year Venezuela will be better than us. So uh, it's quite important for us that we are part of this elite. We speak English in Columbia University. Uh, we have to do something. We have to reinvest in our region. We have to be more protective on the future of our region and not just to depend on governments. Mostly because we're the one who elected them. So uh, before complaining about government, let's see what we as elites can do about our region, about how to bring investment back, how it can be 25%, not 20% of the global economy. It depends on us. Thank you. Uh, so the next question is going to be about uh, what trends of other regions that we can incorporate into uh, Latin America. But I think after this talk, it was very clear that what we should be focusing on is interconnectedness between the region and uh, just being able to share solutions and pressure governments to create uh, regulations and uh, if they don't do it, just to create our own. So um, I want to ask you if you have more, uh, anything else that other than what you already mentioned, but um, anything that you think should be our next steps towards achieving, uh, towards continuing the growth of entrepreneurship and innovation and economic development in general and uh, have the lower risk in our region. Well, on my end, I think that one of the key challenges we have for Latin America is respect for institutions, respect for institutions, actually. I'm going to put it that way. Why so? Um, I think that Brazil is, a, Brazil is an example to make up for the rest of the region, honestly. What happened with Lula, what happened, what happened with Lima is something that in my country would not have ever happened, like not in our wildest dreams. So I think that we need to learn from each other's examples. We need to learn from each other's mistakes. And um, the leaders, and of course, this is by no means a political, a political rally in any way. And I mean, the only one, the only country that had elections already is, is Colombia, and you guys are up for it in, in a couple of in a month. Uh, but you just have to make sure that you are aware of the fact that it's so important that whomever we elect as a region respects institutions because those are the ones that are going to provide certainty going forward for investments to come to a region. And whether you believe that it is, you know, the government's job to actually foster growth or it is the market's uh, hand, the ones that attract investments and through investments we create jobs, whether you are a technocrat or whether you are more of a socialist, I don't care. But in any case, we have to acknowledge the strength of institutions. So for me, that's key. Uh, one of the things that when we talk about Mexico, for example, which is my core and of course my comfort zone, when, when we talk about Mexico, one of the things that I always tell clients is, yeah, Mexico is a country that has been outperforming the rest of the market, but does that mean that it's going to do well in the long term? No. Why? Because we have absolutely no respect for institutions. Our president has absolutely no respect for institutions, and that means that at the end of the day, whenever you're investing and you're putting forward, like um, AMBED is putting forward a $2 billion, $3 billion plant in the northern part of Mexico, and then AMLO all of a sudden with a blow of hand decides to take off that plant, then how on earth do you think that we're going to bring back those $3 billion and, of course, create the jobs that were related to that? That's not going to happen. So institutional respect is key going forward. And uh, not to minimize politics, but we need to make sure that whomever we bring into power actually acknowledges that same importance for us to be able to bring back potential growth into a region. Potential GDP growth in, in Latin America is more than half in the last three, four years. We need to bring back that growth. And in order to bring back that growth, we need to bring back jobs. We need to bring back investments. We need to create new businesses. We need to be disruptive. 
So I think that we're on the right path, but for me, the key challenge going forward is definitely for you. Well, sorry for apologies, I can't talk too much about the current presidency, mm -hmm. so I won't apply this. Uh, but uh, I totally agree, I'm a political scientist, so I have made mistakes in my life, this one, one of them. <laughs> <laughs> but the left and right just exist as if you have democracy. If you don't have democracy, there's no left and right. You can be left wing, right wing, congratulations at least you have a position, but uh, you cannot opinate on a place without democracy. We have not lived on a Brazil without democracy. We don't know what it is. I, I was born during the redemocratization period. So to live without democracy is not something that I know. But my parents have lived through a uh, dictatorship and did not claim it. So to respect on the institution's basics, not only for the economy, it's basics for our own fulfillment. We have to pursue happiness as well as the pace we rise through American democracy. And through any human rights, the right to be happy any way you want to be. That's the basic human right that we have to defend. So anyone that does not defend that kind of democracy, please think twice before you vote. And uh, to be quite considerably about the future of our region is not just about democracy, but how we fulfill our role as citizens. Uh, everybody talked about public corruption, private corruption, it's also a problem. It's not a crime in Brazil, private corruption. But private corruption is the basis of the public corruption. So all of you is going to be a wonderful finances group brilliant managers, you are going to base every time at the fire policies. Few wise. Because uh, our region has been stable because of that. It has been very disconsiderated the ethics uh, role that we have as citizens, as uh, industries, as bankers, as financiers. We are always saying that it's government's job, not our job. It's always our job. And uh, finally, we have to be, we have to think outside the box. There is a brilliant expression, uh, I will speak Portuguese for a Construtor de ruinas. Brazil is a wonderful builder of ruins. We are always late. We are always trying to eat yesterday, not trying to eat tomorrow. We work on the years of tomorrow. So don't be fixed on the yesterday. It's a time that don't belong to you anymore. And uh, I think that we can uh, close this statement with uh, homework, since we're a Colombian person. <laughs> uh, who, of, who of you have investments? Uh, who of you, whose families are investors? Let's do the following homework. Uh, I think what this is Vocês vão pegar os tratos e a carteira de investimentos de vocês e das suas famílias. E vão analisar exatamente quais empresas vocês estão investindo. E vocês vão pensar o quanto vocês estão tirando dinheiro do país e levando para outros. O quanto de impacto negativo e positivo vocês estão fazendo com a alocação de capital de cada um de vocês. Se vocês ficarem felizes, falarem, ótimo, estou gerando impacto positivo para o país, parabéns. Mas eu quero um de vocês que não vão passar por essa sensação. Então é, vamos tentar salvar o mundo, um extrato bancário por vez. É só um de vocês primeiro. No momento que vocês tiverem essa consciência, acreditem, depois que vocês veem o primeiro extrato de impacto, vocês nunca vão olhar o investimento da mesma forma. Então, é, pense que ninguém tem uma ferramenta maior para a informação do que o próprio capital. Onde nós aceitamos investir, onde nós estamos votando. A gente fala de eleição, mas a gente faz uma eleição a cada momento que a gente faz o consumo. Quando a gente decide por marcar e por marcar bem. Quando decide investir em uma empresa, não na outra. Então, é, antes de pensar nos grandes movimentos globais, vamos pensar na nossa participação perante esses grandes movimentos globais. Seus parentes vão te odiar, 
Mas quem sabe vocês assim começam um movimento regenerativo das finanças que vocês operam. Então, é, se, continuem sendo delite, mas sejam delite funcional. Mas eu nunca vivi isso. E olha onde nós estamos agora. Uh, thank you so much, both of you. I think the ideas that we generated here were extremely important about um, interconnectedness in Latin, Latin America and also investing in our own countries and fostering, being the agents of fostering our own development. I think that's something really important. And also being here, uh, like all of us are students. And I also said, I also think that what they said of thinking about going back to our countries, to Brazil, it's really important. Uh, to foster development and to be there and, you know, bring the knowledge that we gain here. So, yeah, I just leave, wanted to leave on that note, but thank you so much. And uh, now I think we have some time for questions, so if anybody has a question, uh, we can take them. Uh, hi. You talked a lot about the need to have connectivity within Latin American countries. What do you think is the role of common markets, such as Microsoft, in increasing the competitiveness of the whole Latin America and of the individual countries? What do, I, what do I think about what? The role of common markets, such as Microsoft, Microsoft in increasing the competitiveness of whole Latin America and the individual countries. Okay, so first of all, I would like to say that Microsoft is a huge player in the market. 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 Microsoft is a huge player in the we're not really targeting the global consumers of the world. So we need to take, we need to take uh, heed of our own competitive advantages. And of course, it's important to develop our own domestic markets, for sure. I mean, and let's not forget that Brazilians buy stuff, Mexicans buy stuff, and Chinese people buy stuff. But we need, to take a, we need to be aware of our competitive advantages. So if we want to, uh, like I said, for example, take advantage of the fact that Mexico right now is still focused on industrialization in order to tackle the U.S. market, given this nearshoring trend, then why isn't Chile exporting copper to Mexico? Then why isn't Brazil exporting iron ore to Mexico? Um, if we are aware, for example, that, uh, you know, that, I don't know, that Brazil exports so much to China, then why isn't Mexico exporting some of its agricultural exports to Brazil instead of doing sending everything to the U.S.? So I think that that's, that's important to acknowledge the competitive advantages that we have as a region in order to, uh, to leverage each other's over existing relationships with the outer world, uh, not just our domestic, our domestic uh, sectors. So of course, common markets make a lot of sense, but even the geographical situation of our, of our of our continent, we're never going to have a, a common market, and Mexico is always going to be more tied to the U.S. I mean, and that's a fact, and nothing's going to change that. But how about acknowledging that that's a reality, and now take advantage of that? Forget about common markets or not common markets. But if Mexico has 50 more more than 50 free trade agreements signed, why don't I leverage on that and create a free trade agreement between Mexico and Brazil, which doesn't exist? which is totally stupid, obviously, but it doesn't exist, in order for Brazil to leverage those 53 trade agreements that Mexico already has in place. Mm -hmm. And we, in Mexico, we don't have something with China. Why don't we export to Brazil in order to take advantage of the trade agreements that Brazil has with China? That's how it is. Uh, any common market or any regulations or um, diplomatic decision is all of those are fictions, and fictions based on an attitude. We don't have a regional attitude. How many of you speak Spanish? How many, <laughs> how many of you speak French? How many of you speak English? That's the, that's the question. Uh, we have to start being more clo closer to our neighbors and start making businesses with our neighbors. We don't have the proper attitude if you think that Colombia is based on not traffic and Mexico is a corrupt state and if they think that Brazil is a corruption based country, we are just ignoring the reality of our countries. We are not exploring the synergies between our nations and there would be no diplomatic adjustment that will resolve that. Otherwise, Mercosul would be operational and look at Mercosul now. There's no attitude for access. So before creating any kind of common markets, let's create a common attitude of development. Uh, 
So thank you so much once again for, for joining us here. Galera, uh, para quem está falando participar do, da sessão privada, da sessão privada, por favor, fica aqui, o restante pode subir para um coffee break. Tá bom? Obrigado. Maravilha. Parabéns aí, até Thank you. 